Welcome to Power Talks with Santosh Shah. In today's episode, we have with us His Excellency Robert Piper, the head of the United Nations in Nepal. His process, constitution drafting, army integration, and citizenship issues are at deadlock, and Nepal's economic growth is at halt. We are facing the most difficult phase of Nepal's modern history. At this time of political crisis or leadership crisis, United Nations can have a very important role to play. Welcome to the show, Your Excellency. Thank you, Santosh. In 2009, you opened up the first show of season one of Power Talks. That's right. You put me on the map. Thank you. We're happy that we have you back again in season two. Thank you. You have spent uh, three years of your life and career in Nepal. And when we discussed uh, in our interview two years ago, we had a lot of hope when we, when we talked about Nepal's issues. But the last two years does not seem to have mapped our hope and, and optimism. How did you spend your last three years and what were your achievements and challenges, if you'd like to tell our audience? It's been a, a busy few years and from where I'm sitting, uh, uh, lots of things to report uh, on the work of the UN system. I'm very fortunate I, when you say, what have you achieved? Well, I, I, I lead a team of 2,000 extraordinary professionals across 20 UN agencies and that community of uh, development humanitarian workers have been working pretty hard since I arrived. We can point at some extraordinary achievements that we've done together with the government of Nepal and the people of Nepal. Leprosy has been eradicated. Um, we're very proud of our, of our work in the cantonments, getting the uh, verified and, uh, miners and late recruits out last January from 4,000 of them from the cantonments. The refugee program uh, has been doing tremendous work, now resettled 50,000 of uh, of the Bhutanese so far into third countries. Uh, our work uh, in, in mine clearance last week was a great moment as we uh, took the last landmine out of the ground and declared Nepal uh, actually minefield free. Which is a huge uh, achievement. It's a huge if achievement. If you look at the other countries which has gone through the conflicts and still dealing with the mine issues. Tremendous achievement. We've been caught up with uh, supporting the process on, on writing the constitution. The food security programs of, of FAO and the World Food Program you know, have got some extraordinary numbers. The FAO's emergency food program supported by the European Union has reached uh, 100,000 farmers in the last 12 months with seeds. WFP uh, last year reached over 2 million Nepalese with, with food assistance. So across the board, uh, lots of you know, proud moments since we last spoke. During your time, Anwin was established and it was extended a few times yeah. and it even closed while, while you're still in the job. What were the promises kept by the Anwin and what are the promises that they, they left unfulfilled? But they were asked to do a very specific task and I think they delivered on it. They were asked to manage a process where the, the military uh, from both sides would, would work together closely and, and address issues before they became, um, they became problematic uh, or became violent. This was a great success. They were asked to come and participate uh, in supporting the elections and making sure that the environment was reasonably free and fair to make sure that the outcome was democratic and acceptable to all. And they were here, of course, to verify um, the numbers in the cantonments and to ensure that uh, there was an independent, if you will, third party that was always present in the cantonments to reassure the public that what information they were getting about what was happening around those 19,000 ex-Maoist army was accurate not to control the numbers, this is, became very controversial, not to stand at the gate of the cantonments and count people in and count people out, but to, but to be a presence and to observe the weapons and make sure that those weapons stayed in their shipping containers and if anything were to happen to them that uh, everyone would be informed immediately and that information would be absolutely accurate and unbiased. I think this was the contribution of Anmin amongst many and I think uh, they did their job. I think they left uh, uh, as they left, they really passed the baton over to the rest of the UN family to pick up where they left off. And hopefully, as they left, this was a signal that the Nepali peace process, in a sense, was turning a corner and entering into a, a new phase. And that's uh, hopefully where we find ourselves as this year uh, unfolds. 4,000 of the Maoist ex-combatants were disqualified and, and released after the admin verification. How do you review their release or their discharge and their reintegration into the society? 
Well, yeah, 4,000 or so of the 23,000 that the UN verified in the cantonments were indeed uh, either under 18 uh, when, the, the, when they were recruited into the Maoist army um, or, or in, indeed recruited into the Maoist army after the ceasefire was signed. And so the UN was asked to help in getting those those 4,000 out of the cantonments, and indeed the Security Council insisted that those minors, those under 18-year-olds, had to leave, and that's what international law requires of it. And the process really took place in an intensive four-week period last January, so about, about 15 months ago now. It was a very drawn-out negotiation. It should have happened much, much faster. This is a, a complicated group of people. They uh, were way too young, most of them, to have been in uniform in the first place. They've been promised all kinds of things by their, uh, you know, by their seniors, their expectations wildly unrealistic. Um, and, uh, and many of them are going back to a, a complicated social situation, if you will, when they go home. Girls that left very demure from the home go back four years later, maybe married, uh, maybe very outspoken, maybe married to a man of a different caste. And so we've also learned to really appreciate that the transition for this group back into, if you will, normal society has been, is, is pretty tough and we've tried to walk with them in that, in that journey. And there's still a lot of fear in the villages uh, when it comes to the Maoist ex guerrillas when they go back to the villas. So, so that's also something to, to look at. We haven't picked up, I mean I think it's uh, they're, they're vulnerable, yes, so, but we've not had any cases so far with 2,000 people, any serious kind of violations of their rights and so forth. They tend to stick together, as one would when you're feeling uh, a, a little bit vulnerable. And, and our program also, and this is not very well known, is, is pretty smart at trying to soften their re-entry. So, for example, the education program where we, we support uh, these guys to go back to school, for every two of them that we support, the UN will also sponsor a third person, a, a person from a, a disadvantaged family in that community to also get a scholarship and go to the school. It sends a signal to the community that, you know, everyone is going to benefit if this process is successful. It's a good way to network. And it's a very good way to kind of repair some of the, some of the damage that's been done in the past. We, we, we do find, I think, in general, communities are incredibly welcoming, actually, for these, for these people. And the process has gone relatively smoothly by international standards, without doubt, very, very smoothly. Now, we have 19,000 uh, ex maoist People's Liberation Army. Yeah. We're looking at integrating them into the Nepal Army. What will be the role of the United Nations if both armies have to be integrated? Well, we'll see. It's a very different caseload to the 4,000, firstly, and we have to be really clear about that. There's, this is a, there's a whole different set of issues around the 19,000 than the 4,000, although we can learn a lot from, from the 4,000, yeah. but a whole new set of of different challenges. Um, I think the negotiation process is, you know, really in full flight at the moment. We don't know quite where it's going to end up, how many will end up in the Nepal Army. Probably a larger number will end up not in the Nepal Army, not in the security forces and looking for, for other options in, in a civilian uh, life, if you will. We wait to see what our role is. So far, uh, we've been providing a lot of technical support to the, to the Secretariat of the Special Committee. We're in the process of handing over a lot of equipment that we collected and bought when we were doing the, the, the previous verification processes, tents and computers and things, to try and help the government uh, very rapidly implement whatever decisions are made at the political level, particularly on the survey that needs to be done for this 19,000. Uh, and then when it comes to the implementation of those decisions, we hope to, and we certainly will offer everything we can in terms of support, particularly for the rehabilitation um, process as opposed to the integration process. The, the military to military part, if you will, is not our strength. It's rather more helping people transition from a, a military livelihood to a civilian livelihood, and that's where that's where we'll focus most of our efforts on the United Nations side. When Amin office closed, it was expected that it would extend further by six months. So in a way, we could call it an abrupt closure in our own journalistic sense. With Amin office closing down, what are the challenges and what are the opportunities that it has left with the UN country team? Amin's, as I said, it's sort of passed the baton on. And I think um, rather than uh, feeling that there's an unfinished business, that rather that it was time, the Nepal peace process was turning a corner into a kind of new phase. The UN 
itself needed to change its strategy to be kind of more re to remain relevant, if you will, to the new kinds of challenges. For us, um, you know, we're hitting the long haul issues of the peace process now, and uh, 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 when we read the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the issues around an election or cantonments and so forth are really the relatively short term parts of the deal. Uh, the long term and most of the real estate of the peace agreement is really about long term transformation, issues around social inclusion, issues around rule of law, issues around good governance and perhaps restructuring the state to make uh, the relationship between the state and the citizen uh, more accountable and more productive in a sense. And that's where the long term development actors really come to the fore. So. This is where our attentions as the United Nations are really turning now, is to help Nepal on those long-term peace issues, which arguably are even more difficult than the short-term ones. And we're going to have to kind of get used to that idea that this is a long-term process. We've learned that all over the world, and, it's, and Nepal will be no exception. But in contrast, the politicians here, especially the CA members, they say that they can solve it in the next two months. Like get the peace process completed and write the constitution, but as you say, it's going to take much longer than that. So how do the common citizen of this country prepare themselves to deal with this uncertainty? Well, I'm not making it up. I read the peace agreement, and I, my understanding and my assumption is that a, a lot of Nepalis understand what's in the peace agreement in the sense that um, the peace agreement was written by leaders who understood the aspirations of their people and understood uh, profoundly the causes of the conflict in the first place. So they wrote an extraordinary peace agreement which mapped a journey out of conflict to a sustainable peace and hopefully prosperity. That was in a sense the promises to the public, but it was also their analysis of the expectations of the public. So I think unless those expectations have changed dramatically, I don't think what I'm saying is a great would be a great surprise to most citizens of Nepal. I think they're going to not lose a lot of sleep over whether 6,000 or 8,000 Maoist ex-army are going to end up in the, in, you know, in the Nepal army. I'm not sure that that's keeping a lot of citizens awake at night, the big majority. I think they're much more concerned that the peace process delivers better education, a, a better behavior, say, by the police in their village, um, a less discrimination in terms of their ethnic origins or their gender and so forth. So I, I, I think I'm... Uh, I'm not saying anything new, and I'm certainly not importing any ideas from outside. I think these are the issues that Nepalis have put on, on the agenda as the peace process issues. So the logical end of the peace process is really, I, I suspect, quite a long way in the distance for now. What you're saying sounds very reasonable and practical to me, but in the last three years we have heard several versions of the peace process, constitution drafting, lots of debate. But you are a person who have been in the center among the donor agencies, international agencies, United Nations, and the government of Nepal, including several political parties. How do you review or how do you see the past, present, and future of the constitution drafting and the peace process of Nepal? Well, I always remind any visitor who's coming to understand Nepal that the, the scale of the ambition that is going on here, and you've got to really respect that. I mean, the issues that are up for for, for transformation that is spelled out in the peace agreement are truly profound, deep, long-term structural issues. So, so I, I think um, the first thing you've got to appreciate the time scale involved. I look back at, at the three years I've been here and I see, um, I see a lot of things to be, to, to be very optimistic about. I see a, a, a CA that is so much more representative than anything that came before it. Uh, I see political leaders of every shade that are talking to each other constantly and of course you can criticize them for talking too much but there's a lot of post-conflict environments where you can't take that as a given that people, uh, those channels are remaining so open. Um, even if there is distrust, there's elements of respect and communication which are absolutely crucial for building, uh, for building peace. I see a republic declared peacefully. You know, I see a, a lot of um, a lot of very sensitive issues that are hard, you know, closely held uh, to people's hearts for many communities. These, these things are in question, they're being changed, the discussions and assumptions are being questioned, 
and that is being done peacefully and uh, and you've got to kind of give full marks for to the state for the nation if you will for managing such sensitive issues so effectively it, looking ahead you know one has to hope that that uh, everything will continue in such a sort of positive way um, one also has to hope that the pace of change of course will accelerate that's something that all Nepalis feel and and they're not alone. I think the international community wants to see uh, a greater, a greater speed in this in this transition. Um, but as they say, uh, I think an ex-president once said, "Hope is not a plan." So it's not enough just to hope that things go well and cross your fingers. But also, you know, it would be great to see a little bit more of a plan laid out, even if that plan gets changed as midway. But uh, I have to say, the, the issues that are laid out in the peace agreement are fairly clear. But it isn't very obvious what is the strategy to get to some of these things. What's the strategy on rule of law? What's the strategy on social inclusion? And it isn't easy to find people, frankly, to talk about these issues in government. So as I look forward, I'm looking for a plan, as, if you will, to make sure that this transition ends up in the right, the right uh, end point. Interestingly, you touched upon a very strong component of the Constitution Assembly. I mean, it has 33% women and representatives from all marginalized groups. Yet, the draft on the citizenship issue is still debated. How can the United Nations ensure or encourage the setting of equal rights when it comes to citizenship issue so that uh, every citizen in this country have their equal rights ensured? Well, citizenship is a very sens sensitive issue and constitution writing itself is very sensitive. We've always been really careful from day one as the UN not to pretend that we have any solutions for Nepal. There is no foreign model that will work. Nepal has to find its own way. We bring the experiences of the world to bear in Nepal, uh, the successes and the failures, and we hope that helps build a, a better constitution for Nepal. Occasionally something comes along and it really forces us to get off the fence, if you will, and not just uh, uh, sit very neutrally uh, on, the, on the sidelines. Around constitution, uh, around citizenship issues is, is one of those areas that's emerging as, as one that we do have a real concern about and we've expressed that to various political leaders. The issue is, is the draft language where apparently there seems to be pretty strong consensus and that language for citizenship basically boils down to a requirement that mother and father must be Nepali in order to pass citizenship by descent to their child. This is a, a very narrow kind of definition of citizenship and the only real, the other, the only other country that has such a, a narrow definition is actually Bhutan in this neighborhood. It's a club that we don't really want Nepal to be a member of and we're really concerned about it in terms of firstly its impact on, on children. Uh, you naturally will have many, many mixed marriages. If you don't have both mother and fa father as a Nepali citizen, it leaves the child potentially without citizenship for years. And it's a very, very basic right. You need it to measure land, you need it to own land, you need it to have a job in the government. You know, to leave a child stateless for a prolonged period is something both unacceptable and, and incompatible with Nepal's treaty obligations under the Convention of the Rights of the Child. The language that comes with this citizenship language in the draft constitution is also very discriminatory at the moment. It basically says if uh, a Nepali woman uh, who marries a, a foreign male essentially um, is required to go and live with that foreigner and is discouraged from allowing that foreigner to come and live here in the sense that whereas a foreign woman marrying a Nepali male can acquire citizenship relatively easily, a foreign male coming to marry a Nepali a woman would have to wait up to 15 years to be eligible for citizenship by naturalization. That is extraordinarily uh, discriminatory uh, for Nepali women. And while we respect and people tell us this is the customs, this is the way we do things in Nepal, daughters go and marry, uh, go and live with husbands, and we absolutely have no role in customs are, we have a real issue when you're legislating that this is how it should be and this is how it will be. Uh, there we feel that that again is incompatible with Nepal's international obligations and, and, and promises to the rest of the world uh, that they will ensure that the state will ensure that discriminatory practices have no place uh, in the law of the land. So we, we are worried about the citizenship issue. It's still under discussion we hope and we hope that the final outcome is something that sits much more comfortably with the international standards that Nepal identifies with uh, across the board. 
The citizenship draft is still looks like the very old model which kept Nepal a very closed country. And now at a time when we are discussing about foreign investments and so many Nepalese are leaving the country for opportunities abroad, I think it will kind of hinder uh, the, the future. Citizenship is really a turnkey right. And indeed, uh, passports and is a very good example. We, we estimate one in third Nepali um, working age males are overseas uh, today, one in three, um, uh, working and sending remittances. It, it, it makes up almost a third of uh, gross domestic product in this country. So it's a, it's a very practical example of where uh, a bad citizenship law is going to really discriminate against a large number of people who are just not going to get access to the same opportunities as others by accident of birth, by accident of, of who their mother and father might be. So, so certainly an area that needs to be looked at very closely. In 2008, the common citizens of Nepal were given the rights to elect the current lawmakers into the Constitution Assembly. But right now, the right to extend the timeline of the Constitution Assembly lies with the same lawmakers. It seems that they are continuously voting themselves in. And if they just continue to keep themselves in the Constitution Assembly and delay the process, can the Election Commission intervene and announce a new election? The Election Commission? No. Uh, the Election Commission it can only hold an election if it's instructed to by the president, and the president can only instruct the election commission um, on the advice of the government and cabinet, if you will. So there's no, there's no chance of a uh, kind of unilaterally declared uh, election, no. So how do we see the, the end to the constitution drafting completion if this continues, that the constitution assembly members keep themselves voting in? Really, your question is, how long can this go on for? And we're getting kind of frustrated with the wait. And it's, uh, I think, a, a, an understandable sentiment. The Supreme Court uh, uh, very recently made a decision just a couple of days before the expiry of the last uh, extension of the CA and that essentially confirmed that uh, the CA is the, has the right to, um, to change the constitution, if you will. That's what, the, that's what their right is with a two-thirds majority. Um, but it did, it did send a signal also to the CA, this very recent uh, Supreme Court decision, um, both that any ex that extensions should not be beyond six months, in a sense, as an installment, and two, um, putting them on notice, the CA members, that extensions without proper justification are not, really in keeping with the spirit of the interim constitution and then thirdly uh, that any extensions would be under um, judicial review so it's putting on notice if you will the CA members that uh, they do have that right but it's a right that needs to be exercised judiciously I think that was really what we all took away from this Supreme Court decision. You have already contributed three of your years in, in career and life to Nepal and you plan to do so for next two years. Yes. Next two years, what is it that you plan to achieve? That's a, it's a tough question. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm ambitious in uh, myself for Nepal and the changes we want to see. I, I obviously, uh, by 2013, we'll be almost at the finish line on the Millennium Development Goals, and I, 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 I would hope we are much closer to achieving the goals where we're falling a bit short, particular on issues like uh, uh, malnutrition or sanitation. Um, Perhaps more importantly, uh, making sure that um, the quality of the progress on the other Millennium Development Goals is starting to be distributed a bit more equitably. Uh, I hope very much that we'll be uh, even further down the process of uh, implementing the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, though as everyone would have gathered by now, I don't expect the logical end of the, of the peace process to happen even when I'm in Nepal because it's way beyond my... Uh, my uh, period of time here. So certainly that we've walked uh, several steps now further down in, implement, in start, getting started on the long-term transformation issues around rule of law, around social inclusion, around the restructuring of the state. I hope also by the time I've left, uh, I, I do hope we've left Nepal better prepared uh, to manage the natural hazards that it faces. We haven't really talked about natural disasters, but it's an issue that um, I lose a lot of sleep about, uh, which is to make sure... It's a very serious one. It's a very serious issue, and it's one that is competing for attention at the moment, um, and that's, that's very dangerous. So we, we worry about the yearly flooding and the mudslides, and of course we worry a lot about the 
the potential of a very large-scale earthquake. And, uh, and so one of my big priorities uh, over the next two years is to raise enough money to retrofit at least 900 schools uh, and some of the larger hospitals in the valley uh, to equip the emergency services better for responding and working with people like the U.S. Ambassador and obviously the government to better organize the international community to come very quickly when called on in the event of a large-scale disaster to make sure that we save as many lives as possible. So that's uh, perhaps the third big area of ambition I have before I leave this country. Excellency, it's always good to talk to you. And thank you for being on the show today. And we look forward to hosting you again in the Season 3. I look forward to it, Santosh. Thanks very much. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back next week at the same time. Until then, good luck and goodbye. Thank you.